With me is Stan Messer. He is a psychotherapist, researcher and writer and was Dean of the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers University. He's also a very influential figure in the development of brief psychodynamic therapy and psychotherapy integration as a whole. So I'm so happy to have you, Stan. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Alexander. <laughs> you started out from a traditional psychoanalytic position and were influenced by an approach I believe very few of us are familiar with, which was secure frame theory. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah? Can you tell us a little bit about those early experiences? Uh, well, to go back a little further, uh, my undergraduate education was at McGill University. This is in Montreal. Uh, that's where I grew up. And uh, McGill <clears throat> it was very um, both physiologically and experimentally uh, oriented. So I had a very a strong foundation in sort of the basics of, uh, of psychology. And psychoanalysis was frowned upon, by the way. <laughs> only got a negative view of it, which of course made me uh, curious and suspicious to begin with. Uh, when I left McGill, I went to Harvard in what was uh, called the Department of Social Relations. And it included psychology, the uh, more social side of psychology, sociology, and cultural anthropology. So it was a very broad kind of education, very different from what I had learned at McGill. And I was exposed there to psychoanalytic uh, thinking uh, as well, and particularly to personality theory. But, you know, one can't learn personality theory without coming across psychoanalysis. So I became interested and curious about that and <coughs> eventually found my way into a program in psychoanalytic therapy at uh, it was then called Hillside Hospital in uh, Queens, uh, New York and Long Island and there I met uh, Dr. Robert Langs um, who was really uh, quite a uh, brilliant uh, psychoanalyst who was developing his own approach to psychoanalysis. It was very much psychoanalysis and very traditional in some ways, but he also believed that what was most important in therapy is that you keep to a cer certain boundaries, certain frame in the way you conducted the therapy yeah. because that's the way you were really going to get at unconscious factors, which he very strongly um, uh, believed in. So I was uh, very uh, influenced by him. I was supervised uh, by him uh, for a year and uh, learned to sort of tune in and to listen to what people's where people's associations uh, led them. Mm -hmm. And I had many other supervisors and courses and so on during the two years that I was at Hillside Hospital in this fellowship program in psychoanalytic uh, therapy. But in any case, his idea of the unconscious was that it was not purely intrapsychic, but that it was uh, influenced by external events. Mm -hmm. So that if, for example, the therapist were to break the frame in some way, what we might call today create the ruptures or do something that was not quite kosher, the unconscious would pick it up. You'd have to listen for that, and you'd have to work that out. Um, with the patient. It seems like a very disciplined sort of practice. I remember you speaking about uh, it involved much effort doing this kind of approach. You know, it did uh, because it involved a kind of neutrality and, and a sort of lack of gratification as it were on, on both sides, both for the therapist who had to remain silent um, and for the patient who didn't get that much <laughs> from the uh, therapist. So. I, I learned a lot from it, but I also realized over time that uh, there was more to doing good psychotherapy than uh, what I learned in this, um, in this process. So I changed over time, and one of the directions I changed was to become uh, more, uh, more supportive, uh, warmer, more in the relational mode, and more integrative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll be curious still staying with this early experiences. I know you also trained for a little bit with uh, short-term dynamic psychotherapy and you had some contact with David Mallon and uh, so Davin Liu. I, it's my impression from reading about this that they used a lot of videotaping and research based on taping. Did this have any impact on you? 
It certainly did. Um, I became interested in brief dynamic therapy um, because I felt that, I mean, long-term psychoanalysis and psychotherapy was not available to many people. It never was and never will be just by virtue of the intensity of it. Uh, that's not to detract from its value, but as a sort of a public health treatment, it was lacking in that way. And so I started going to conferences uh, that they were just initiating at the time. And this was, you were right, the main figures then were uh, Malan, Davenlu, and Sifnios. And I went to a conference in Montreal, in fact, where they showed the videotapes of what they were doing. It was very exciting and very interesting. And that was uh, the beginning of, of my interest in brief dynamic therapy, both because of the, I think, the, the public health importance of it, that is, most of the therapy that's done in the world, never mind here, uh, is, tends to be brief, tends to be rather brief. And the advantage of learning brief dynamic therapy is that it has a structure, it has a theory, it has a focus, it has a time limit. And it is, of course, much more amenable to research uh, than long-term uh, psychoanalysis, which has its own advantages. Yeah. And I hasten to say there's a place for both. I, I think that one can and should do uh, medium-length and longer-term therapy as well with different goals in mind. Yeah, you certainly were ahead of time, and also David Mallon and a lot of your colleagues in knowing the importance of doing this short-term dynamic therapy, because the truth is that with the times and economic pressures, it seems like more and more there is this demand, right, to do short-term therapy. There, there is, and we know also that patients typically don't stay very long in therapy. The mo <laughs> tell people that the mode, the modal number of um, therapy sessions is one. There's no <laughs> after the first session. Yeah. But that it's been shown empirically that once you have about somewhere around 12 to 20 sessions, um, you're going to get the biggest impact during that time period after which there continues to be gains, but much more slowly. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a case to be made for not a two-session therapy, but a 15 to 20-session therapy, where the curve shows that uh, a decent percentage of people are uh, substantially helped. Yeah. Well, and moving on to your own work in the Rutgers University, the, the university led you to contact some different figures, and I'm kind of curious, I have to be honest, with one particular uh, person you came into contact, which is Arnold Lazarus. Ah, yes. He's sort of on the other side of the fence, in a way. So he, he of course, was known for his multimodal approach later, but he was quite the behavior therapist, in a way. So what are your memories of Lazarus as a person and as a clinician? Well, <laughs> um, I enjoyed my association and friendship with Arnold very much. And this was despite the fact that um, we agreed on practically nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> we, we went, if he saw black, I saw white. And I guess it's sort of... <laughs> <laughs> our, our our relationship appealed to our oppositionalism. <laughs> Arnold Arnold had been a, had been a boxer in his earlier days in South Africa, yeah. and he would come out fighting. <laughs> and he had the broken nose to prove it too. By the way, um, as an aside, uh, Les Greenberg will tell you that Les was sent by his parents to see uh, Arnold. Les was also South African, uh -huh. and Arnold <laughs> gave him a TAT. I don't think, I don't think a Rorschach, but at least a TAT, and trying to be helpful to him. This is a bit of history that wow. uh, you might be uh, uh, interested in. Very interesting. But uh, Arnold was a very uh, bright and able guy, and made I think an important contribution in the area of. Um, technical eclecticism in particular and being open to incorporating um, different points of view but particularly different techniques into his, uh, his therapy. We had various debates both in front of the students and if you know it in the literature there were two articles that we wrote together in which we each presented our own understanding of a case mm -hmm. or of um, issues around technical uh, eclecticism. But Arnie was uh, scrappy. That is, he liked to mix it up, and uh, he was not shy. He was very uh, assertive, but also very kind in a way and very uh, generous. And 
<clears throat> we would give workshops not only to our own students, but acro across the uh, state of New Jersey uh -huh. and uh, enjoyed mixing it up. So I have very fond memories of him. You might know that he died. It's about, I don't know, two years ago now, yeah, um, yeah. I guess. But, uh, you know, he made, a, he made his contribution. You must have made quite a duel. <laughs> well, people enjoyed, apparently, our uh, sparring because we each had our own point of view yeah. and uh, expressed it. And I think it helped people understand, for example, what are the differences between a psychodynamic perspective. And Arnold's, although he was multimodal, that's true, and he was very uh, eclectic, was really based mostly in social learning theory and he, he came out of a cognitive uh, behavioral uh, tradition. Yeah. So it was more that than anything else and he was in fact, in fact quite skeptical about uh, anything <laughs> psychoanalytic. Yeah, yeah, he was quite <laughs> verbal about that. <laughs> well, you, I believe it was in 1984 that you edited with Hal Harkovitz uh, the psychoanalytic therapy and behavior therapy is integration possible, and yeah. then jump to 2002 and you're publishing a paper with Bruce Wampole saying let's face facts, common factors are more potent than specific therapy ingredients. So I'd like to ask you, because this kind of seems to trace some trends in psychotherapy integration, do you believe that the project of psychotherapy integration, in a way, has been transformed over time into a search for common principles of change? Well, you've certainly done your homework, Alexander. <laughs> uh, both the book that uh, Hal and I uh, edited, which at that time was, you know, something really quite new, yeah. uh, and then uh, moving, uh, you know, to notions of common factors and common principles. And that, uh, sorry to, to interrupt you, that book is quite uh, impressive in terms of the people there. You have Mike Mahoney, you have all the, the people collaborating. Thank you. We had really a wonderful group of authors, serious scholars, yeah. who, uh, and as you know, the way we set that book up, people wrote chapters and then there were commentaries on exactly. the chapter yeah. and then responses. Uh, I remember to Paul Wachtel commenting on yours. On the what on what Mayor Winokur and I wrote, particularly about the visions of reality and how they were different in exactly. a psychoanalytic therapy and in a uh, be behavior therapy. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, beginning of debates that uh, Paul and I have had over the years. <laughs> and by the way, again, as an aside, one of the wonderful things is about CEPI and about these colleagues that I mentioned. You know, we may not always see eye to eye in terms of a theoretical outlook or. Uh, principles of psychotherapy, but there's a lot of um, affection and mutual respect, yeah. which has meant that we can continue to <laughs> friends and to enjoy each other's company uh, and so on, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so I, look, there's been an evolution in my own thought over time. Uh, earlier on, if I can bring this in, <clears throat> I was sort of, if you like, to use a term from uh, parliaments in Canada and Britain and so on, the loyal opposition. <laughs> that, that is, I was skeptical about integration and, you know, the paper that I wrote with Mayor Winokur called Some Limits to the Integration of Psychoanalytic and Behavior Therapy had got quite a good press and, you know, people were very interested in it. And uh, basically our point of view was that uh, behavior therapy and psychoanalytic therapy had very different visions of reality. The psychoanalytic being more tragic, the behavioral being more comic in the literary genre meaning of that term, not ha-ha funny in any sense, and so on. Anyway, I won't go into more detail about that. Uh, but over time, as I got more exposure to different points of view, um, I realized that there was more... Um, room for um, collaboration, for integration, for over overlap, uh, and so on. And by the way, I think this is one of the beauties of uh, CEPI, that people have a chance to have dialogue yeah. and discussion, and it doesn't mean we all end up in the same place. I don't even think we need to do that, yeah. but we do learn from each other, and I think I learned. And um, so uh, over time, I began to recognize the importance of uh, if you like general principles or common factors or things that really pertained to all the different therapies. Uh, and so Bruce Walmpole and I wrote that article um, 
on uh, let's face facts, common factors are more important than technical, uh, whatever the title of the paper was, technical features uh, or technical um, uh, interventions. However, I will say this. Um, I often tend to see things from, you know, two sides. So, yes, there are common factors, and some of them Marv Goldfried has been uh, very uh, uh, smart about uh, pointing out, uh, like uh, whether it's increasing awareness, giving feedback, therapeutic relationship, and so on. But, in fact, Winokur and I wrote a commentary on Goldfried's famous article on common factors in American Psychologist, pointing out that if you look carefully at what are called common factors, as applied to different therapies, they're not necessarily as common as they first appear. That is, there are different ways in which the therapeutic relationship can express itself. So that one kind of therapy, like experiential therapy, may uh, stress the uh, sort of the real uh, relationship. Psychoanalysis may stress the transferential aspects yeah. uh, of the relationship. Yeah. Uh, the behavior therapist will stress the coaching, teaching aspect of the relationship. And these are different, and they go in different directions. So, yes, there's a commonality in that the therapeutic relationship itself is an important central variable, but how it gets expressed in different therapies can also be different. This is a very interesting point you're making, and I'd like to connect it with your 2013 article, which is the free mechanisms of, free mechanisms of change in psychodynamic therapy. And you presented the mechanism of insight, affect, and alliance. And at first I was thinking, well, uh, this seems like something that with time became common ground towards all therapies. Even in CBT, the importance of affect and alliance has become more important. But as you said, maybe they are seen in a different light. And you cite some studies about the insight part that I found interesting. I'd like you to comment on that. Because you cite some, I think, short-term dynamic therapy studies that kind of said basically that insight was a predictive of outcome in dynamic therapies, but not in CBT what do you make of this? Well, look, the way in which um, insight is brought about in the different therapies uh, is different. It's yeah. not quite the same to, let's say, interpret unconscious conflicts in a psychoanalytic therapy as to help a person become more aware of how he's coming across to others and uh, in his workplace or something, as might happen in a uh, cognitive uh, behavioral uh, therapy. So in that way, in those studies that you're thinking of, the insight, I think, was defined in such a way that it came out of a more psychodynamic approach. And so maybe it's not surprising then that the correlation between, you know, the um, interpretations allowing for insight are more correlated with those, um, in that kind of therapy than they might be in a cognitive behavioral therapy. And it really makes my point, and you're helping me to bring it out, that is that insight is not just insight, and awareness is not just yeah. awareness. It's different to be working with um, uh, helping a person become aware of the bad effects on his health of smoking compared to, uh, you know, unconscious um, guilt, that is, uh, making the person self-punish. Yeah, yeah. you know? I mean, these are not quite the same. And if you look carefully at the therapies, they're not all the same, even if people will use a term like awareness or insight, yeah. <coughs> say, see, it's all the same. Yeah, some, some, <coughs> some, it's some, different with uh, someone like Marvin Goldtree. Yeah, sometimes you quote Wittgenstein, so it seems there's always a language problem here also. Yes, uh, that's right. That, uh, and this is why also I've been skeptical about the idea of a, a common uh, language across the different therapies. Yeah. It's a nice idea. This idea has been around for a long time in different um, um, spheres to try to have a common language to decrease conflict. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. you know there was a language called Esperanto that uh, was a common universal language meant to create a brotherhood of man and to decrease the possibilities of war. <laughs> Didn't work out. <laughs> Didn't work out the way that Zamenhof uh, had, uh, had hoped it would. And so even within uh, you know, the different theories of um, psychotherapy, uh, a common language would in certain ways 
denude the theories of some of their subtlety and complexity. Yeah. So I am a pluralist. I think that we need more than one kind of therapy. Yeah. I don't believe, although some people do believe this, and I think believe it quite strongly, that the object, for example, of CEPI or of the integrative movement is to come to one unified, universal, common uh, theory and therapy. And that is sort of the correct one. Yeah. Well, it sounds nice, and maybe it would be nice if it can happen, but I don't believe it. Yeah, I'm okay. a pluralist. I think that we need more than one point of view, and I think not only do we need it, but it's inevitable. Yeah. Well, in 2009, uh, let me quote you here. You wrote that one cannot escape the necessity for theories of therapy, even in considering empirical principles of change. Having said this, I would imagine after what you just said that the univ the future the hypothesis where uh, we would have substituted therapy schools for just principles of change seems like kind of a dystopia for you. Uh, yes, maybe dystopia is somewhat Too harsh. <laughs> strong, um, though I know exactly what you mean, um, but that if in fact you know, the, the to speak more broadly about it, um, again, what one one language and one theory and one approach leads to, in my mind, is a certain totalitarian outlook. Yeah. That is, it becomes too uh, rigidified and too much the idea that there's only one approach to the truth. And uh, philosophers, much smarter than I am, have you know pointed out that. You always need other points of view, if for no other reason than to understand your own. It has to come up against something else. This was John Stuart Mill, actually, who um, set forth a number of principles as to why uh, there has to be more than one, um, one uh, approach. So <clears throat> the, the book by Louis Castingay and others about uh, common principles itself found that, yes, there were some common principles, but in fact, there was a great deal of um, uh, diversity uh, that existed as well uh, across the different domains, across uh, psychopathology, uh, and so on. And I think that's what we're dealing with. I think basically we're talking about a social science. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking about a, a unified field theory as in physics, and uh, that we have to learn to live with that. And, and what that leads to is ongoing dialogue, ongoing efforts to... Um, uh, to be integrative uh, and to realize that there's more than one way to be integrative and there's always going to be more than one theory around. So, viva la difference. Viva la difference, that's right. <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> you have you written have only, uh, uh, also about your own inclinations in conducting therapy, that they continue to be in the direction of idealism, subjectivity and introspection. Nevertheless, yep. I'd like to ask you if you think your own vision of reality, as you call them, has it had any significant changes in your career? <clears throat> um, Yes, I think that um, when I was more steeped solely in psychoanalysis, I, I think I was more in the tragic and ironic modes. Okay. And believing those were uh, the most, uh, if you like, profound and complex and so on. But I think I, I've come to realize that the romantic and comic views have their place as well. And one way in which I changed over time, whereas I was looking at those visions then with Mayor Winokur uh, in such a way as uh, they, they, they uh, separated the different therapies, and as I said, psychoanalysis being more in the tragic mode, experiential more in the romantic, behavioral more in the comic, uh, and so on. I've written in recent years about how if one maintains in any one case, these four outlooks, I think it leads to a richness and a kind of integrative approach yeah. Yeah. Uh, to therapy. Because everyone has those sides to them. And um, I have presented cases, in fact, in the literature trying to show how even though you know, you're working with someone who has bipolar disorder and there are great difficulties and so on, there are other facets to them that are important to consider. If you like their strengths, 
uh, their talents, which are much more in the romantic mode, and that uh, to some extent happy endings are possible in the comic mode as well. And that's the irony in a way that you've got these different sort of competing visions, but that can, I think, come together uh, for the therapist in helping him or her to have the broadest view um, of the patient. Yes, yeah, so having that flexibility even in the visions of reality. That's right, even, even within those. So that, that's where I have really, I think, changed over time in the way I've, I think about it. Uh, those visions. I first saw them as setting limits to integration mm -hmm. and now I see them more as uh, can be an aid uh, to integration. Yeah. I'd be curious to do a little joke exercise with you. If you were in therapy, can you describe what would be for you your ideal therapist? My ideal therapist? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I would like someone who would be uh, warm and uh, accepting, uh, very attuned, uh, empathic, and someone who understands um, unconscious uh, factors so that uh, he or she could bring to light things that I may not be and likely not to be uh, aware of. Uh, I think it would be good if that person had the flexibility to bring in um, approaches and techniques from other uh, theories when that seemed like a good idea and not to be limited in a way uh, only to one uh, in the fashion <laughs> that I, you know that I call assimilative um, integration so that it uh, becomes seamless and is part of the uh, therapy which I think one develops um, over time the ability uh, yeah. to do. So I'd say those are um, the features that I would uh, I would look for. I think that summarized perfectly a lot of what you've been saying also. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in terms of psychotherapy research, you have been actively involved for quite some time also in the single case studies. Oh, And yeah. I would like to know, because you know, we live in a very specific paradigm, mostly given to outcome research. So I'd like you to kind of play devil's advocate and just share with us a little why you think single case study is really an important tool to understand psychotherapy. You know, here too, in terms of uh, research outlook and methodology, I'm a pluralist. I think we learn um, from different approaches and we learn different things from different approaches. So uh, while I can, I'll put in a plug for a book that Dan Fishman Frank Tantilio and um, um, uh, uh, David Edwards uh, have edited, uh, which is called roughly Case Studies Within Randomized Control Trials, Integrating Quantitative and Qualitative Approaches. Okay. It will come out uh, within the next uh, six months or so. Oh, great. And um, so, yes, I have been really quite invested in this and in a journal called Pragmatic Case Studies in Psychotherapy, edited by uh, my friend and colleague Dan Fishman, but I'm involved in it as an associate editor. And, um, you know, the standard uh, research approach, which we'll say is the randomized control trial or correlations between process and outcome and so on, are important and we learn things in general about them. But what we don't get there is the richness of a case, mm -hmm. the importance of con the context in which things occur, the variety uh, that happens. So what we're pointing to with single cases is to compare within a randomized control trial a successful case and an unsuccessful case. Those get homogenized when you give overall results in a randomized control trial. But when you dig into it, you learn things about, well, why was this case successful and this one was not successful? Could have to do with, of course, the client. It could have to do with the therapist. Could have to do with the uh, interventions. But uh, we think you learn things uh, about uh, these cases by really digging into them. In addition to which, there is research that shows that clinicians are much more influenced by individual cases than they are by the research. Mm -hmm. You could say for better or for worse, but in fact, that's the case. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, Diane Chambliss and others have done research on this, and they themselves were surprised at the extent to which clinicians will ignore the research in favor of uh, case studies. Now, what we want to do is to make the case study a much more, if you like, scientific enterprise than it has been, mm -hmm. so that there is a, um, a way of writing up the cases that people can compare uh, across uh, the cases. Uh, we look for objective measures uh, where possible, uh, audio taping or videotaping. In other words, bringing some of the features of an objective, empirical, scientific approach to bear on the, uh, on the case study. And we hope over time that there will be like an archive of cases built up. So much like in the law, when people want to study or, 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 in, or, or have at hand a certain case that they're working with, they can draw on the, this database and say, oh, this is what helped in this kind of uh, case, yeah. which you're not going to get exactly from a randomized control trial. Yeah. And you certainly have been helping a lot in that sense with the journal you just mentioned, the pragmatic case studies, which well, I really enjoy. Yes, you do. Well, that's wonderful. I'm glad. And you, as you can see, it's also done in a scholarly fashion. That is, there's a commentary. Uh, or commentaries uh, on each case and often a response from the author. So you engage in a dialogue and you learn from that, of yeah, course. Yeah. Th there was one particular, if I might mention, one particular case there by Mike Lambert presented in, about a super, what they call the super shrink, Eddie, Eddie Vlas, I think was her name. Well, I, I remember, I don't remember particularly the name, but it was quite a, an interesting case because it makes the outcome pure <laughs> monitoring with yeah. just trying to figure out what this particular therapist was doing with their patients. So, and then they had commentary, and it's a very nice journal. So that's a good example of sort of digging into a case that would not um, otherwise appear just in looking at the overall results from a um, randomized control trial. Yeah. Is there yeah. Any is there any other topic or uh, issue that you feel still has very under-researched in psychotherapy? <laughs> you want to make a list? <laughs> no, um, that one's hard to answer because we've been at this for some time now. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember what comes to my mind is Ken Howard's pointing out that, um, that psychotherapy by virtue of the number of studies that have been done, if you look at it as a medical procedure, is um, better supported than any other medical <laughs> by virtue of the number of cases and the number of studies and so on. So, you know, we've pretty well covered the ground, but there are always, you know, new things um, coming up. We have new uh, technologies, for example, and... Um, ways of using, just to pick one example of a, a colleague of mine, is using an app on the, uh, the iPhone uh -huh. or, or smartphone to uh, help people with borderline personality disorder um, when they need some help on the spot that they can phone in or they can consult something on the, uh, on the app. So yeah. in other words, adapting newer technologies to um, to therapy and probably Skype and tele mental health and so on um, is another area that we're going to see more uh, studies in. Multicultural area, of course, is very important and not assuming that um, we know what there is to know by studying one particular, you know, ethnic group or race or what have you that uh, we have to learn across cross culturally and uh, uh, within uh, across different um, ethnicities. So, I mean, these are some of the areas that I think of that we're going to need um, uh, more research in. And I would like to think a development of the single case um, study as well. Yeah. And, the, and the whole area, by the way, of narrative, uh, too. Um, I like what I see in that way, that there is more uh, attention paid to narrative kinds of methodology, like grounded theory and so on, uh, in... Um, in uh, psychotherapy. Yeah. See much more of that both at CEPI and at SPR uh, in, um, in presentations. Okay. Well, 
Yeah. We're drawing to a close, but first of all, I'd like to recommend anyone who'd like to read a little bit more about your life. There's the wonderful article that you wrote, How I Have Changed Over Time as a Psychotherapist. I believe it's in the <laughs> Journal of Clinical Psychology. Yes, yes, that's right. But I'd like to finish with one last question that I've asked all of our colleagues in these interviews, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. And Not that is, what is the advice you would wish to have received when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? The advice that I wish I had received... Um, I guess when I think back uh, to to the beginning, um, things were very polarized, and mostly what we had then was uh, psychoanalysis. Although there were, you know, family therapy was developing, behavior therapy was developing, but I think the uh, ad uh, advice I would like to have gotten was to learn very broadly. That is not to think that there is only you know sort of one way to the truth and that we have to divide ourselves into uh, tribes and uh, you know theoretical corners which people of course still do and it's I suppose human nature in a way but I think that's the advice I would like to have gotten and advice that I would like to give uh, to others to to remain open to learning from other uh, approaches because there is um, sort of a wealth of uh, uh, information and models and uh, interventions and so on and that ultimately we do uh, probably the best therapy and do our patients the greatest favor uh, when we're uh, informed and have sort of a broader uh, tool bag or the way Marvin Goldfried puts it uh, more hyperlinks <laughs> to different areas that uh, to draw to draw upon and in fact that's one of the things that experts have uh, that beginners don't is that they can link to many uh, ideas and perspectives and attitudes and possibilities for intervention. Yeah, and Stan, your own work has certainly helped me and other colleagues a lot in that sense. So I'd like to thank you so much for this opportunity to talk. Well, uh, well, very kind of you to say that, Alexander. Of course, those of us who write, we we hope to that there are some echoes from the void from time to time <laughs> that indicate to us that someone out there is listening, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, profiting uh, from our work. And uh, really, I can see that you are quite familiar with uh, things that I've written over time, and uh, so it's very flattering to me. And I'm very appreciative of your uh, taking the time to do that and, uh, and to interview me. Thank you so much, Stan. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>